We would like to thank Podcorn for sponsoring this episode of Tech Time Radio. Explore sponsorship opportunities and start monetizing your podcast by signing up at podcorn.com forward slash podcasters. Let me tell you about Podcorn. Podcorn is an absolute must for any podcaster starting out. Now, when we started out Tech Time Radio, we started out in a back office with a couple of mics. We expanded to a studio, and then now, as you can see, we're on the radio and have distribution into other markets. Having the ability to have Podcorn at the start of our podcast would have been a dream come true. Guess what? With Podcorn, you now have the amazing opportunity for podcasts to receive sponsorship, such as host reads, interview segments, and topical discussions. With Podcorn, there's no middleman. Podcasters of all size can browse and choose opportunities right on their platform, set their own rates, and collaborate with brands directly without exclusivities. You never give up the rights of your podcast in Podcorn, and they're here to support you everywhere possible. Visit podcorn.com. Again, that's podcorn.com. Podcorn is a true success for those starting their podcast dreams. Broadcasting across the nation, from the East Coast to the West, keeping you up to date on technology while enjoying a little whiskey on the side. With leading-edge topics, along with special guests, to navigate technology in a segmented, stylized radio program. The information that will make you go, hmm. Pull up a seat, raise a glass with our hosts as we spend the next hour talking about technology for the common person. Welcome to Tech Time Radio with Nathan Mum. Welcome to Tech Time with Nathan Mum. Obviously, I'm not Nathan. The show that makes you go, hmm, technology news of the week. The show that's for the common everyday person talking about technology, broadcasting across the nation with insightful segments on subjects weeks ahead of the mainstream media. We welcome our radio audience of 35 million listeners to an hour of insightful technology with a bit of whiskey on the side. Uh, for those of you who might be confused, I'm usually sitting on the left side of Nathan. He is not here today. He uh, attended a convention down in Florida and came back with a special gift of uh, COVID. So now he's at home hacking. He was partying hard. Yeah. <laughs> so we live we live stream during our show on five of the most popular platforms, including YouTube, Twitch TV, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We encourage you to watch us live or visit us on TechTimeRadio.com or tweet us at hashtag TechTimeRadio during the show. We will do our best to respond. Uh, my name is Mike. I am originally from Arizona. I, While I am not the technology expert, I my bailiwick is in human behavior. Uh, I came to the Seattle area about 10 years ago. Next to me, taking uh, taking my seat, is uh, young uh, Mum the Younger. That's right. Mum the Younger. So that's Jonathan. Happy to be here, Mike. Great to have you here. Uh, you are also in the tech field. Would That's you like to tell us a little bit about what you do? That's right. I am in the tech field. Uh, the apple did not fall short from the tree uh, between Nathan and I. And I'm a network manager for a large uh, Fortune 50 company. So I make sure that the Internet stays working. And I know a little bit about technology on the side. All right. Perfect. So, obviously, we come from different backgrounds, but we're trying to bring the best technology show possible every week for our family, friends, and fans to enjoy. So, welcome, everyone. Now, let us start today's show. Now on today's show. All right, today we're going to talk about, guess what, uh, Twitter and Elon uh, we are also going to explore a little bit in detail of the purchase of Twitter by the tech giant. Crypto as part of your retirement plan. What do you think? Fidel Fidelity Investments thinks so. Uh, last week, we talked about space and microgravity. This week, we're going to ask the question, uh, can you grow meat in space? Plus, our guest, Nick Espinoza, the CIO from Security Fanatics, explores how to wipe my identity from the internet, or maybe not just mine, but, you know. Finally, we explore why Sonic 2 broke records for a video game movie, and uh, did you ever Yahoo? In addition, we have our standard features, including This Week in Technology, My Mesmerizing Moments, and, of course, our Pick of the Day Whiskey Tasting. 
So sit back, raise a glass, and welcome to Tech Time with Not Nathan Mom today. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time to start our show with our loaded question of the week brought to you by Elderberry Boost. Get your Elderberry Boost today at elderberryboost.com. Mike, or actually Jonathan. <laughs> Mike. Jonathan and Nodi, our question of the day is, what is a terrible excuse for not attending an important family event? Well, of course, the worst would be you forgot. Because if it's an important family event, then clearly you didn't prioritize it or put it on your calendar when you were supposed to. So, I mean, for, for me, that's number one. If you completely forget, that's just the worst. Oh, okay. All right. Odie, do you have, a, do you have an opinion there? Um, I would just say just not wanting to go. Just being straight up with them. I don't want to go. Ooh. Yeah, that's like a hard hitter right there. That's not even an excuse. That's just an outright. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm but just I, being honest. Yeah. I okay. think that's pretty bad. Right, because you don't even want to be with those people, maybe, yeah. if you're saying that. Well, I think my excuse would be, uh, you know, I had to wash my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, that. I think Nathan's used that excuse a couple times, too. Oh I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So that was our loaded question of the day. Uh, Jonathan, as always, we're going to have our whiskey tastings during the commercials to see if our selected whiskey gets zero, one, or two thumbs up by the end of the show. That's right. We want to make sure you listen all the way through to pick up a good, interesting facts on Mark's mumbles. And uh, will that make you go, hmm, with the whiskey facts of the week? Now, on to our first segment bringing you the top technology stories everyone is already talking about for the weeks to come. These are factual stories that are ripped from the technology news headlines. Hit it. What's happening in the world of technology? This is our top stories in the first five minutes. Okay, welcome to Top Stories in the First Five Minutes. Story number one, you guessed it, Elon and Twitter. We've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, and if you haven't... Uh, uh, known about this, uh, technology may not be your first priority because it's out there everywhere. They've officially accepted his offer and he's going to buy it. Right. So Musk and the board of the Influential Social Network have agreed to a deal that values the company at about $44 billion. Twitter said in a press release this past Monday, Musk will pay shareholders $54.20 per share, representing a 38% premium on Twitter's closing stock price on April the 1st. When the tech mobile disclosed a 9% stake in the company, uh, it made Musk one of Twitter's largest shareholders. The entrepreneur, who already runs Tesla, SpaceX, and other companies, made his unsolicited offer to buy the company earlier this month. While Twitter was initially expected to reject the offer, the company reportedly warmed to the idea after Musk revealed his financing plan for the bid, which included backing from the investment bank Morgan Stanley. The deal, which was unanimously approved by the Twitter board of directors, is expected to close later this year. Still needs to be approved by the Twitter shareholders. This agreement caps a tumultuous relationship between Musk and Twitter and raises questions about the trajectory of the social network. Twitter has struggled in the past to grow both its user base and ad sales as it competed with bigger companies such as Facebook and Google. Uh, Twitter is has set a goal to reach $7.5 billion in revenue and 315 million users by 2023. The company reported having 217 daily or yeah, 217 daily users who see ads in the fourth quarter of 2021. Musk, who has 83 million followers, is an avid user of Twitter, but is also one of its loudest critics. He has publicly raised questions about how Twitter moderates content, repeatedly polling his father, followers about changes that could be made in the company. His uh, most recent quote is, free speech is the bedrock of a functioning democracy, and Twitter is the digital town square where matters vital to the future of humanity are debated. He also wants to make this uh, Twitter better than ever, by enhancing the product with new features, making the algorithms open source to increase trust, defeating the spam bots, and authenticating all humans. Twitter has a tremendous potential, and he looks forward to working with the company and community, or community of users to unlock it. So that's kind of what we've been talking about for the past few weeks since uh, this came, came to light a few weeks ago. Now, Mike, how often do you use Twitter? 
Uh, like once, never. <laughs> <laughs> once, never. So this news, does it feel like it impacts you a lot yet? Uh, it, only, it, it only impacts me in the questions that it raises about what these ultra rich folks are doing with their time and their money. Oh, because it can also raise questions about the future of the Internet and social media as well. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, what what are the impacts that he, that he's wanting to change? You know, we're talking about uh, he him loosening restrictions on the types of content that can be posted. Uh, he wants to get rid of spam bots. I know there's something in the works that has suggested that that's already happening. Uh, there's And so there's some things that he's doing that has caused a bit of controversy. That's right. So, you know, as... As we keep moving through these these odd days, you know, uh, Twitter has been a flashpoint in the conversation about the bounds of free expression on private platforms, and the company has fought misinformation about elections, COVID, and other topics. Its decisions have prompted assertions on the right that it censors conservative views and on the left that it promotes hate speech. Trump, who is known for hurling insults in Twitter's 280 character blast was often at the center of some of these controversies. And then, uh, you know, there's, that's just the tip of the iceberg. That sure is. So that, that's what's going on right now. I think we can, we can wait and see what happens. And, uh, that means that Jonathan, we can talk about your story. That's story number two can meet be grown in space. Now, Mike, did you want to be an astronaut as a kid? I was an astronaut <laughs> in my head. <laughs> of did course. Did you ever imagine, though, what you would be eating on a space station? Uh, no, but, you know, I grew up on science fiction stories where they were little tablets and you pour a drop of water and there was suddenly a five-course meal like a la Jetson, So Right. And we're not quite there yet. So where we are is somewhere a little bit different from that. So while Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk both want to colonize space, NASA's working on putting people on Mars. But what do you eat if you actually set up a working community on the moon or on another planet? There's Dehydrated that. ice cream. Yes. Uh, that that was the first thing I thought of. because I, I Astronaut ice it. cream? A- absolutely. Okay. You go to the Science Center, you get the astronaut ice cream, and you're a happy kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's not quite what they're working on. They are working on experiments, of course, to see whether plants can grow in space for growing the vegetables and fruits that you might want to enjoy. But as of last week, a new test has begun to see if meat cells can grow in space. There was a small step for trialing a potential nutrient source and one possible big leap at least if the experiments are successful with the future of space travel. This particular experiment was dreamt up by Aleph Farms, an Israeli company that specializes in growing meat from cells, and it is currently being tested by the first all-private astronaut team to visit the International Space Station. I assume that this is the same group that we talked about last week in response to the microgravity on the brain, but I don't know if that's true or not. Indeed. And so there are some skeptics that say that the method of growing meat because of gravity uh, might be too unstable for the astronauts to rely on this method and that growing the space meat will never accomplish what it's meant to do, which is actually grow the meat that could be comparable to something that you would bring up from Earth instead. Well, I, I kind of look at it like uh, microwaving a peep. Have, have you ever done that? <laughs> I was not allowed to do that. Oh, well, when you microwave, microwave a peep, you know, aside from the little screaming sound, it expands. And then when you take it out, it collapses on itself. So that's what I think is going to happen. But Right, because you, know. you, you don't have the same atmosphere that, that you have in space, obviously. So the the process doesn't look anything like a traditional farm where you're or even with the lab-grown meat, because that's completely different from growing a cow as well. Well, we haven't really gotten that one quite correct yet. So, Oh, you don't like Beyond Meat or an Impossible Burger? 
Yeah, I, I, I haven't tasted those. Oh, you so should. I, I probably won't. <laughs> Some of them are, are pretty decent, actually. So if they can pull it off as well as the companies here on Earth have done, then they're going to be pretty good. So the difference, though, that the skeptics have uh, is that the cells from a cow are, of course, fed the things they need to grow, like amino acids and carbohydrates. And that eventually becomes the meat that we buy at the grocery store through a process called cultivation or proliferation. But the meat that is grown in tanks are more like what we'd find in a brewery rather than a farmyard. The, because the whole life cycle of the animal is bypassed. Well, yeah, aside from, you know, there's not something being born, living, and then being slaughtered before we harvest the meat from it. Uh, I'm, I think the the biggest implication is whether or not this type of process will work on, say, Mars. But, uh, you know. Right. There we go. But it's an important question because we're already working about working on the problem of how to get to Mars. And so then the second question is, what do you eat on Mars? Well, a cheeseburger will do for me. <laughs> You're just going to fill up this space shuttle with all the cheeseburgers that you need for That's your That's right. There's a Burger King right <laughs> down the way. All right. So story number three. Uh, Fidelity says that it will offer crypto in retirement accounts this year. Uh, Fidelity, which is the largest retirement plan provider in the United States, announced plans to offer Bitcoin in 401k retirement accounts to its account holders later this year. The company is set to allow investors to allocate up to 20% of their 401k accounts to Bitcoin, though employers will have the ability to lower that cap. Ahead of the workplace retirement offerings and platforms at the asset manager, uh, I'm not sure what I, how I feel about that. The offering, which Fidelity is calling its digital assets account, will hold Bitcoin and short-term money market investments to provide the liquidity investors would need to engage in daily transactions if they choose to do so. The currency will be held in custody with Fidelity digital assets to ensure institutional-grade security. While the offering will launch with Bitcoin as its only digital asset, Fidelity plans to offer other cryptocurrencies in the future. The company has been at the forefront of its peers in the digital asset offerings, launching a custodial service for institutional investors in 2018 and creating a Bitcoin fund for accredited private wealth clients in 2020. So do you have any, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, first off, Mike, by being one of the first to offer it, they get all the free publicity saying we're the first to offer it. So whether okay, or not you that... actually engage in the Bitcoin part, by being the early adopter, they get the extra publicity and the notoriety of being in the digital forefront as an investment company. So, I, you know, I kind of look at this maybe like uh, uh, penny stocks or something that's not that's fairly volatile. So I don't know that being the first to offer this is outweighs the fact that, that this is still a tumultuous market. It's absolutely tumultuous, but we've seen, even with the stock market this week, that it can be up one day and down tanking the next day, and the whole th the whole thing is gambling pretty much anyway. Well, so. yeah, as the new uh, head of Twitter said, you know, it's a hustle. <laughs> so, Jonathan, that our time is up. We got you through the top stories of the week. If you want to learn more about this, please visit us online at www.techtimeradio.com. Click on our episode section or blog to get even more details on these stories and features. Now it's time for us to get ready for our first whiskey tasting of the day. Uh, but up next, we have Nick Espinoza joining us for the show on Ask the Expert, Expert segment, and we are going to ask him how to digitally erase ourselves from the Internet, or if that's even possible. Make sure to join us after the break. You're listening to Tech Time Radio with Jonathan Odie and myself, Mike Gorday. We'll see you back here in a couple of minutes. 
Hey, Mike. What? Have you heard of Elderberry? Only in reference to a Monty Python movie. Well, let me tell you, Elderberry Boost. Again, that's elderberry-boost.com. Elderberry Boost. Yes, Mike, that's Elderberry Boost. You can choose organic Elderberry Boost, that eight ounce size. It's available on sale right now at eleven ninety nine. But you're listening here right now on Tech Time Radio, so you need to go to Elderberry. That's E L D E R B E R R Y dash Boost dot com and get some today. Elderberry Boost. Elderberry is an all natural organic immune system booster and antiviral. Elderberry is known to actively fight against viruses, including colds and the flu. It also works as a natural remedy for allergies, cancer, digestion, heart disease, high cholesterol, headache, toothache, weight loss, and reduced inflammation. It's a natural and healthy diuretic and has many antiviral properties. While it is famous for fighting the flu, it is effective for any illness. Elderberry Boost was created to provide a quality organic elderberry to their customers. After searching years ago for a perfect elderberry syrup, none could be found, so they essentially created their own homemade recipe. If you would like to get 15% off your first order of Elderberry Boost, just put in the discount code TECHTIME at checkout. Again, that's elderberry-boost.com. Elderberry Boost. Hey, Mike. Yeah, what's up? Are you ready to launch your new career in coding? Treehouse has one of the best and most affordable online classrooms for you. At Treehouse, we've rethought the learning process and built a proven system to get you the skills and knowledge you need to achieve your goals. When you're done with a course, you haven't just watched a video. You've learned, practiced, and absorbed the key concepts. Choose to build a portfolio, create a network, and land your dream job with the boot camp style tech degree program. Land a dev job this year. Treehouse. TeamTreehouse.com. Learn to code, design, and more. All on your own time. Enroll today. Classes range anywhere from two months to nine months for completion. Whatever your goal is, we'll get you there. Start your seven-day free trial today by visiting TeamTreehouse.com. Again, that's Team, T-E-A-M, Treehouse, T-R-E-E-H-O-U-S-E.com. And make sure to tell them Nathan sent you. All right. Welcome back to Tech Time with Nathan Mum, who's not here, who is enjoying his uh, day off from contracting COVID in Florida this weekend. Tech Time Radio is a weekly hour technology show that talks about current technology in a simple format without having to geek out. Brought to you by me and Nathan. We just had our first whiskey tasting today during the break, and uh, I'll tell you what we're testing or tasting for our pick of the day. Today we have chosen Corsair's Rymageddon, which, uh, what did you think? I'll tell you a little bit more about it when, when you tell me that. Well, I, I heard, Mike, that from Nathan, that you are a fan of rye. Is that right? Yeah, no. <laughs> I am not a fan of rye. Rye is, it's it's okay. So when you hear the word rye, my God, and that just makes you really excited about this, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. I, I, I re- get really excited about this. <laughs> so did you like the, did you like the initial taste? Yes, I did like the initial taste. It, I, I knew a little bit about this rye coming before, and the description of it says that it is, Distilled from malted rye and chocolate rye. So I'm curious, did you get any notes of chocolate on that first sip? Uh, yeah, in the aftertaste. In the aftertaste. In the aftertaste. So yeah, Corsair Rye Mageddon is a blend of malted rye, chocolate roasted rye, and malted barley, making this whiskey sweet yet peppery. It is made from scratch by Corsair, barreled and aged by Corsair, and quality controlled by all of y'all. Uh, Corsair Distillery is one of the major craft distillers in the industry. They began in 2008 in Bowling Green, Kentucky, before becoming the first craft distillery in Nashville, Tennessee in 2010. So we'll talk a little bit more about this. We're going to move on now. Uh, We are going to bring up the award-winning co-author and the best-selling cybersecurity book, Easy Prey, TEDx speaker and host of the Deep Dive nationally syndicated radio show. Let's. Start our next segment. Welcome to the segment we call Ask the Experts. With our Tech Time Radio expert, Nick Espinoza. 
So Nick was accepted in the Forbes Technology Council, an invitation-only community for world-class CIOs, CTOs, and technology executives. Nick, welcome to the show. We call you. Me. You're welcome. Are you? Hey, are you drinking anything today? Oh, I mean, is the sky blue? Is the Pope Catholic? I mean, come on now. <laughs> you know I am. <laughs> All right. You know, can, can, I, can I also say? Now that Nathan's not here, can I talk about how great Fire Eye is? Would oh that, no, <laughs> I, I don't no, think that's no, allowed. No. He he not, will not, hear not about so that. Okay, all right. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All right, here we are. <laughs> so yes, uh, standby is my log of Woolen always because, quite frankly, I'm a Scotch guy. So there you go. All right. Well, Nathan's going to miss not being a part of the show today, but Jonathan and I are, are excited to have you. We're going to ask you some questions, and I know you've probably been talking a lot about the stuff going on across the water here, but we're, we want to yeah. talk about something else. Are you okay with sure. that? Let's do it. All right. So apparently the Board Ape Yacht Club Instagram com- compromised was compromised in a $2.4 million NFT phishing scam. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so the board ape thing is is amusing to me, but but first things first. Um do you want do you want to talk first about what an NFT actually is or do you want me to just like dive right in to essentially what happened here? Yeah, why don't you tell everybody what an NFT is? I mean, we've talked okay. about it on the show several times, but go ahead and and explain it to our tech timer listeners. Yeah, I guess the the reason being is that there while, while while I'm sure you've got a lot of nerds as listeners, myself included, there's plenty that aren't. But NFT is essentially a non fungible token, and more or less that means that it's basically unique and it can't be replaced by something else. So, for example, uh, in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, if I give you one Bitcoin and you give me one back, we'll have exactly the same thing. But a one of a kind like trading card or something like that, like the only baseball card of Babe Ruth left is non-fungible, meaning it is the only thing. And if you trade that for a different card, even if it's like the last Mickey Mantle on Earth, you have something that is completely unique and completely different. And at a very high level, NFTs are part of the Ethereum blockchain. Basically, Ethereum is a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, but that blockchain also supports NFTs, which is basically some extra information or extra code that makes that blockchain work slightly differently. That extra information is that non-fungible token, meaning if you own that extra information or code, then you own something unique. Essentially, you have the sole receipt and proof of ownership over an NFT. Now, NFTs can be basically anything digital, you know, drawings, music, you know, you want to turn on an AI, you can make that an NFT as well. But a lot of current, like the buzz, the excitement around this right now is digital art. It's very easy to create. It's very easy to sell as an NFT, hence the Bored Ape artwork and all of that. But here's the thing, people can take copies of that, screenshots of all those kinds of things. But Essentially, what you own then is that unique piece of code on the Ethereum blockchain that says you own the original. It's like owning the Mona Lisa and everybody else owns a picture or a poster of it. But that, in a nutshell, is essentially uh, what an NFT is. All right. Well, I for a minute, I thought I was an NFT because, you know, I'm a unique snowflake. You are indeed. <laughs> you are indeed. <laughs> okay. Aren't we all, though? Aren't we all? That's right. right. We're all non-fungible tokens. And Mike there and Nick, go. I've seen these Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs being promoted on late night talk shows with celebrities that are purchasing these NFTs. Why? Oh yeah. Why would a celebrity want to board Ape Yacht Club? It was just the thing, right? Right. Well, when everybody's jumping off a bridge, <laughs> other people go along. <laughs> that's, that's, okay. You know, I mean, think about it, right? And, and that's. <laughs> That's essentially what it is. We are we are all jumping off the bridge together, hand in hand, into the digital realm. And, and so, by virtue of that, sure, you're going to get on that bandwagon. You're gonna you're gonna want to get in on the craze because what we've seen essentially is NFTs go up in price. Uh, but that said, we've also seen some serious disasters, like the guy that bought uh, the very first tweet ever. The very first tweet by Jack Dorsey himself was made into an NFT. Right. And some guy, I, I think he's in the Middle East, bought this for like almost $3 million. And then the other week tried to sell it for like 40 or $50 million. And the high bid was like $277. Right, right. Right. So so is that the end of the NFT craze? Probably not because Board Ape just showed us we can lose millions, uh, you know, due to scam. So here we are. All right. Well, the company disclosed the hack on Monday morning in a tweet Interestingly enough, warning followers not to click on links or mint new tokens. So uh, 
Nick, how did this happen? I was reading that it has has something to do with airdrop. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, it, it, they're they're a tech company, right? So they're going to post on tech platforms like Twitter. You know, nobody's sending registered mail anymore in that sense. But we need to break this down a little bit because I think we actually need to start with a warning here. Now, obviously, or, or I should say, rather, like the warning that they gave. So they're saying, don't click on links in that tweet. And they're basically alluding to you clicking on a link or tapping a link, and that could be infected or malicious. It could steal your information, possibly your cryptocurrency or other NFTs, those kinds of things. Now, they also mentioned in that tweet that they are not minting tokens as of yesterday, meaning April 25th, 2022. And basically, they're not making new NFTs. In other words, if you want to buy a Bored Ape NFT and someone is basically trying to sell this to you saying it was created, it's brand new on April 25th or beyond, they're essentially saying it is fake, it is a scam. That is the heads up. Now, as for the airdrop thing, they are not actually talking about Apple, you know, the Apple airdrop, all those kinds of things. This is what they're actually talking about. Essentially, what happened was another tweet from an unaffiliated user, uh, basically this user's unaffiliated, I should say, with, with Board Ape, they claimed to show an image that had been posted to the Board Ape account promoting an airdrop, which is essentially a free token giveaway. So essentially, it's in line with like the don't click anything, because if you're seeing something from Board Ape that says, hey, we're doing an airdrop, meaning we're going to give you a free token, and obviously people are tempted to do that because... NFTs are hot, free NFT, all those kinds of things. It's obviously a scam. And approximately, just as I was reading about this, 44 people fell for the scam, resulting in at least 133 NFTs being stolen. And interestingly enough, it goes beyond just like two and a half million or so, because it also appears that of these 133 NFTs, 14 of them are estimated to be worth uh, basically roughly $3 million each. Wow. So we are talking about serious money here. It also appears that the criminals are already selling these NFTs uh, basically in NFT aftermarkets as well. And apparently 23 of these have already been sold, reaching around 2.4 million, which is where a lot of the media is getting that number. And so what I've read, basically, it's not 100% clear on how Bored Ape's Instagram was hacked, but in a statement provided uh, basically by Bored Ape, they claimed that their two-factor authentication was enabled in Instagram. And so that should have made it a lot harder to get in. So wow. we don't have any definite word on that but that's essentially the nut the nuts and bolts of, of the board ape yacht club okay. you know and you've seen them it's a bo it's literally a board cartoon ape i mean you can't miss them yeah you know, i know this everywhere. is one of the most popular nft groupings that they have uh, yeah i guess the guy that owns the first twitter thing he should be doing some of this backdoor selling too if they're getting that much money from a stolen NFT or I should. Well, I offered him $300 for the first tweet and he didn't take me up on it. So now if you steal art in the real world, you've got to like ship it on a boat and fence it in a third world country where the feds aren't looking for you. How do you fleece an NFT? So understand what the blockchain is in that you can set up anonymous accounts. I can go and set up basically an Ethereum account or an account or a financial account that can accept Ethereum outside of the United States. And I don't have to give them like a passport or a driver's license or anything along those lines. So it, it makes it very hard to track it back to me. Now, that said, a lot of the different blockchains like Bitcoin, for example, intelligence agencies and law enforcement are getting very adept at actually tracking these things. We also saw a case of that a few months ago, where what looks like the most obnoxious couple in the history of couples stole about, what was it, three to four billion dollars um, from Binance back in 2016. And they've been attempting to launder it over years through various blockchains like Monero, Ethereum, and others. And eventually law enforcement was actually able to trace that back and, uh, and arrest them. And if you look at that couple, you you would think they are the most obnoxious people on the planet. Nice. So like conceptual artists kind of like, you know, kind of thing. They're, they're absolutely nuts. All right. Well, you want to move on? Yeah, we've got another question for you, Nick. Let's do it. With, with the news of Elon Musk buying Twitter, let's say that I don't want my Twitter account anymore, or I don't want my tweets to be in Elon Musk's hands, or... You know, I'm just sick of my social media out there. Uh, a few weeks ago, Nathan was talking about how to scrub information from the Internet. And I've looked up several of these tools myself that claim that they'll go and erase all of your identity and your information from the Internet. So 
How possible is this? And what tool would you recommend if somebody wanted to start looking into doing that for their own personal information? So can you scrub all of your inter- in, uh, internet information or all your internet, in, all your information from the internet? No, nope, that ship has sailed. It is impossible to scrub all of your information And it's not because we're talking about, let's say, your name or your social security number, all those kinds of things. There's a lot of things we can do about that. But if you didn't know, your device, like your iPhone or your Android, of which pretty much everybody on the planet has one these days, does what is known as fingerprinting, meaning it is giving essentially telemetry and information about you and your device uh, to third parties, not just Apple and Google, but marketing firms, all those kinds of things. Uh, Essentially, a combination of these factors identify you to your phone. And those are things that you don't think about as part of your identity, but they are, and nobody really talks about that. I have yet to see any service out there claim that they can scrub that from Apple and Google and a zillion marketing and data mining firms out there. So understand that, that that even if you're getting rid or attempting to get rid of your name and your footprint and your tweets and all that kind of stuff, here we are uh, basically in that boat. But what you can do is kill your surface information, such as identity for major platforms, which makes it harder to harder to find you. So, for example, killing social media accounts, uh, like you mentioned, you know, killing accounts on shopping websites like Amazon or other web service ser- services that you use is a good way to start doing that. Also, apps data mine the bejesus out of you. So getting rid of needless apps in your life slows down that information gathering and telemetry that is being gathered from your phone or your computer or anywhere else. You can also remove information from some of the public, uh, you know, public sites like these easy accessible data collection sites like, oh, I've got to find somebody like Spokio or People Finder, all these different places. And there's a service out there, or I should say multiple services, but one of the big ones out there is called Delete Me. I want to say they charge like 100, 150 bucks a year, something along those lines, and they will do that for you and then every couple of months check up to make sure you're not back there and continue to remediate that removing you from that you know they can't hit all of the data brokers nobody can hit all of the data brokers worldwide as i mentioned not to mention things like foreign governments like the chinese government if they're grabbing your information through platforms like tiktok good luck getting that out of their hands but this will make it harder for you to be found on things like Google. As you are being removed from these things, Google's algorithms have basically a harder time finding you. You can also go to Google, hit them up to say, remove outdated uh, search results on me. They actually have uh, a portal for that as well. And finally, you can kill existing known email addresses, and that's a real solid way to scrub yourself since a lot of things are linked, especially your logins that contain basically or link you to your data uh, out there. So you can kill uh, emails and set up new email accounts as well on, on Gmail or ProtonMail or wherever you want to go. Nobody should use Yahoo anymore. Heads up. You know, all of those things are, are, are you know, essentially at your fingertips. And that helps uh, basically scrub you, if you will, from the Internet. But it's never fully going to go away. It's just not possible. Not to mention the fact that if you've ever been in the news, then you can go to like, you know, whatever news source like NBC or ABC or whoever and probably find articles on yourself from a while back. And they're not really going to remove them unless you get like a court order or sue them or something. So it really just basically comes down to is like dusting a picnic table in a in a desert. Sure. <laughs> so instead of it, scrubbing, it, it should be just dusting. You You can do it. But it takes vigilance because, you know, the dust is going to come right on back. Yeah, and, right. and, you know, and that's that's simply the, the way it is. I mean, we're not going Amish, right? I mean, right. I'm not getting a horse and buggy and churning my own butter, you know. And so by virtue of that, every time I go to my local supermarket to buy butter with a credit card, they know. You know, so so understand this is such a multifaceted thing. We are the most data mined population in the history of humanity by far. And it's only getting worse right now. Right. OK, uh, well. Uh, Jonathan mentioned uh, Twitter. I sure did. Uh, yeah. You want to give us a quick take on Elon Musk purchase and if he's going to be making some security changes and what those might be? Yeah. But I, you know, before I answer that, though, because this is actually what I'm talking about today on my in my own stuff, um, we have to, I think, address the biggest concern with this situation, which is Elon Musk describes himself basically as a free speech absolutist. And so there is a real palpable fear out there on both sides of the political spectrum that he could do things like turn back the dial on content moderation, potentially unraveling years of work that basically curbed things like misinformation, 
hate speech, all those things. And that obviously is a separate debate on the politics side. Right. I personally don't think he's going to do that because if he does and basically all of that insanity comes back, they're going to lose money. And I don't think he's going to do that in the way that people think he is. I think it's going to be more superficial than one side of the political spectrum would like. But the primary concern that we have here in cybersecurity isn't so much the security settings for the users as it is what Musk said he's planning on doing with Twitter's proprietary code that runs that platform. One of his many proposed plans for Twitter is to make their code open source, which means it's publicly available for everybody to see how Twitter was created and how Twitter runs. Now, Musk is claiming for the record that this change is basically um, you know, going to help boost trust in the platform because everybody can see what's going on. And to be fair, Twitter itself was multiple this under Jack Dorsey as well. And we can't forget, though, that for years, Twitter has faced an onslaught of things like false news, basically data breaches, all those kinds of things. I mean, even Elon Musk's profile got hijacked on Twitter, along with a lot of top celebrities for a cryptocurrency scam a few years ago. So bringing it open source is a concern and that we basically fear that Musk would turn Twitter into an open source platform and it would make it more susceptible to attacks. So think about it this way. Like we just went through a massive vulnerability disaster um, that saw literally intelligence agencies leveraging open source software known as Log4j to break into everything because like a zillion platforms were using Log4j. And that was a very severe problem with Twitter being open source, potentially anybody malicious or an intelligence agency agency could find a huge vulnerability that basically nobody caught at Twitter itself, not tell anybody and use that to exploit Twitter in some way, shape or form. It's a huge concern. It's a huge concern. And on top of that, if they make the algorithms as well, um, basically public, then that is a huge thing because people could figure out how to game the algorithm system. Yeah, right? So if right. you game the algorithm system, you can go viral, even if you're Russian intelligence, you know, with a disinformation campaign. These are problems, not to mention the bot networks and all those kinds of things. And there's good technology out there already without having to go open source that is open source to defeat bots. Things like human ID. Human ID would be a perfect thing to integrate into Twitter to really combat this without having to make Twitter open source and open up all of these problems. Not to mention the fact that we have another problem with this, you know, not to to rail against this, but basically what he's saying is you have to use at some point, one of the proposals, I don't think it'll go through, is no more anonymity, meaning you are going to be you. I, I'm going to be Nick on Twitter and that's all I can be. That's a problem because anonymity is good for certain groups of people, specifically those that are dissidents in authoritarian regimes that might be using Twitter as a public platform to get information out there. The Electronic Frontier Foundation was railing against this for like the last couple of days as well. So these are huge, huge problems that we have um, with potentially um, Musk taking over and making these changes. I'm not even talking about the politics. This is just straight up the nerd and security side of this. And so I think everybody's looking at this critically right now. Right. And yeah. Mike, that's kind of why I was mentioning it at the very start is that what we see with Twitter, the governments and the agencies and other private companies, they're going to watch Twitter very carefully to see right. what they can get away with or in inverse what the governments can impose on social media companies like Facebook right. or other right. social media right. companies. Right. Well, this that, is definitely a very complex uh, and uh, difficult situation to be in. And all we can do is wait to see what he does with it. Yeah, so. yeah. and. That's, a, that's a, a very important point. Any major change from any major tech platform is basically looked at as, as a kind of like an incubator. Where is this going to go? What's it going to do? Can I get away with it? All Would right. it work for me? All right, Nick. Well, thank you for joining us. We're going to leave now, come back in a few minutes with This Week in Technology. Thanks for joining us. It was always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, see you Nick. next time. And we will see you next time. Right on. All right. Let Hello, us. my name is Arthur, and my life's work is connecting people with coffee. Story Coffee is a small batch specialty coffee company that uses technology to connect people to each product resource, which allows farmers to unlock their economic freedom. Try our medium roast founder series coffee, which is an exotic bourbon variety that is smooth, fresh, and elegant at storycoffee.com. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. Today, you can get your first bag free when you subscribe at storycoffee.com with code TECHTIME. That's S-T-O-R-I coffee.com. And now, let's look back at this week in technology. 
All right, perfect. We're welcome back to Tech Time. Uh, April 25th, 1996. The big question is, do you Yahoo? Yahoo begins as advertising its web-based search service on national television, televisions featuring the tagline, do you Yahoo? I don't know if you remember that. The ads first air during Late Night with David Letterman, Saturday Night Live, and Star Trek. This was a very early example of the internet entering into the mainstream. Yahoo grew rapidly throughout the 1990s. Yahoo became a public company via an initial public offering in April of 1996, and its stock price rose 600% within the first two years. Like many research engines and web directories, Yahoo added a web portal, putting it in competition with services including Excite, Lycos, and America Online. By 1998, Yahoo was the most popular starting point for web users, and the human-edited Yahoo directory was the most popular search engine, receiving 95 million page views per day, triple that of rival Excite. And that is what happened in 1996 on April the 25th. So that was our This Week in Technology. If you ever want to watch some of Tech Time's history, with over two years of video, you can visit techtimeradio.com to watch your older shows or sign up for our newsletter to subscribe to the best technical information or be a part of the private Tech Timers Facebook group to talk with us live all the time. Up next, we have Gamer Time, so we'll see you after the break. Hey, Mike, did you know that Unidragon puzzles are a great relaxation? Yes, I did. The 21st century widespread digitalization pushes people to have gadget-free rest. In this case, puzzles become a convenient and actual way of having rest. Yeah, they're a great way to relax. They give your brain a reboot. Is Make sure that you visit Unidragon.com with the discount code for 10% off with the code TIME10. That's T-I-M-E, the number 10, for all of our Tech Time fans across the nation. Do you know that puzzles are relatively simple tools that solve a complex range of problems? In game form, we learn useful, analytical, and communicative skills that will find the application in work, study, and other spheres of life. Yeah, they are great forms of relaxation and revitalization. Do you know that Unidragon's collections now have dinosaurs? Oh, that's my that's that's one of my favorite things. You got to make sure you keep the promo code. It's time 10 because all of our audience across the nation can use time 10 to receive a 10 percent discount at Unidragon. That's Unidragon dot com. Don't be fooled by other imitation puzzle makers. Visit Unidragon dot com. The only spot for your true thinking puzzles all right welcome back to tech time today i'm your host mike gorday and we have jonathan mum the technology expert is my co-host uh nathan's out sick with uh the dreaded covid variant uh how was your whiskey tasting my whiskey tasting is pretty good. I'm enjoying the the smoothness that the Corsair Rhymageddon has. It definitely has, as you noted, that chocolate aftertaste to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's pretty enjoyable, I feel. All right, perfect. Well, before we go on to our next segment of Gamer Time, we're going to talk about Mark's Mumbles. And now for Mark's Mumbles! Brought to us by Story Coffee. Visit storycoffee.com. All right, today's uh, whiskey is Corsair Rhymageddon. It's produced by Corsair Artisan Distillery uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, classification of American rye whiskey. It is non age stated, rumored to be seven months, 46. Alcohol by volume or 92 proof. Uh, there is no disclosed mash bill, and this price is about $55 for 750 milliliters. Mark goes on to tell us that childhood friends Derek Bell and Andrew Weber began home brewing beer and wine in a the garage. They hit a snag while working on a prototype biodiesel plant, causing Andrew to remark that making whiskey would be much more satisfying. And the idea stuck, and the two found themselves studying distilleries and spirits. Founded in 2008 in Bowling Green, Kentucky, before moving to their current residence in Nashville, Tennessee in 2010, 
Corsair made their mark by creating whiskeys that were outside of the traditional box that so well defined releases from the major Kentucky distilleries. This helped draw a lot of attention to the company's unique products, which have totaled over 30 in the company's short lifespan. And I, I do have to say that there is a smoothness to the, this one that I don't usually find with rye whiskeys. That's right, Mike. It's it's a different type of rye, and that's why I brought it, knowing that perhaps you weren't the biggest rye fan. Perhaps we could win <laughs> you over with one that was a little different. All right. Well, we will get on with our pick of the day a little bit later. Right now, we're going to move on to our next segment about video games. Ready, go. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, you're on. Well, Mike, in the movie theaters lately, have you been back to a movie theater since uh, they've reopened? I have not. You have not, so you might not have seen Sonic 2 or Uncharted. I have seen neither of them. Now, have you played any of the Sonic the Hedgehog or Uncharted games? Well, yeah, I was around when, when it came on, yes. So, lovely, lovely. Yes. Sonic was one of my favorite video games as a younger person. And it is one of mine as well. It's the the video game movie industry is breaking records with both of those movies. Sonic 2 broke the opening video game movie adaptation weekend records with its first weekend. And Uncharted is now in the top five of worldwide top grossing video game movie adaptations. Well, that sounds... Interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> now, as a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog as a kid, would you be interested in checking out the movies because you were a fan as a kid? Uh, it depends. Some I like to watch. Uh, I haven't been really all that motivated to see the Sonic the Hedgehog movies. I had to even watch the first one. Oh. Well, I enjoyed them. I went uh, with my nephew. We had a great time. So if you are a fan... Of those video game franchises, do know that the movie adaptations are getting better and better, and it is probably worth your time if you're a fan of either of those franchises to check out both of those movies. Yeah, we also know that uh, they're possibly making a Minecraft movie. That's right. With uh, Jason Momoa as Steve. Yes, the main character. I'm a fan of Jason Momoa. I, th Of course, that would be a voice-acted position. Uh, really? I want to see a live action <laughs> version of that. I would too. Uh, I don't know how blocky they would be able to make Jason Momoa look, but I would be certainly interested in that. And because of the popularity of video game movies right now, they are also, of course, going to start making a Sonic 3, as well as a Super Mario Brothers animated movie with none other than Chris Pratt as oh. Mario. All right. Well, that that certainly, you know, I'm not going to say... Anything more than that. So <laughs> why don't we move on to our final segment? This is Mike's Mesmerizing Moment, presented by Story Coffee. Visit storycoffee.com. Uh, one of the things that we were discussing earlier about these movies is why why they may seem so appealing to people and some of the issues that we have. And one of the reasons I think is because as a game player, uh, you immerse yourself in this alternate reality. And so we get attached to these little characters that we have this story about. And so when we go to mo making movies, we want to continue to experience that level. So I think that's probably one of the primary reasons why these are so uh, important. And that's... All I'm going to say about that, we do need to move on to our whiskey tasting of the day. Uh, Jonathan, do you give our Corsair Rymageddon a thumbs up or a thumbs down? I give it a thumbs up. Okay. I am going to give it a thumbs up, too. Surprise, oh, surprise. Oh, I did it. Yeah. It, it's not a bad, it's not a bad, uh, very smooth taste and very good uh, sweet flavor afterwards. So... Any any final thing you like to say about the rhyme again? Uh, just that it was very delicious, and uh, we all hope for Nathan's recovery so he can be here next week. 
All right, perfect. So we're out of time. Thank you for listening and hope you have uh, enjoyed the part of our show this week. Uh, Click on techtimeradio.com via caller. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us on Tech Time Radio. We hope that you had a chance to have that hmm moment today in technology. The fun doesn't stop there. We recommend that you go to techtimeradio.com and join our fan list for the most important aspect of staying connected and winning some really great monthly prizes. We also have a few other ways to stay connected, including subscribing to our podcast on any podcast service from Apple to Google and everything in between. We're also on YouTube. So check us out on youtube.com slash techtimeradio, all one word. We hope you enjoyed the show as much as we did making it for you. From all of us at Tech Time Radio, remember, mum's the word. Have a safe and fantastic week.